the most worshipful brother, Dr. David Hume, MBE, our Grand Ma Master of Ceremonies, Director of Services from the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. Thank you. <laughs> County Grand Master, platform party, brethren, sisters, bands, men and women, members of the public and of the Orange family, I'd like to thank you for your invitation to be here today. It's a great honour and privilege to help you mark the 323rd anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne. And I bring you fraternal greetings from the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland and also from my own private lodge, Macramore LOL 291 in Larne District. I congratulate Macramore District LOL and all those involved in the organisation of this commemoration today. We celebrate the victory won so many years ago at the Battle of the Boyne and we remind ourselves of the impact which it had. It secured civil and religious liberty, was the cornerstone of our modern constitutional democracy and preserved the Protestant tradition, faith and community in Ireland. In some shape or form this victory has been commemorated since the outcome of the battle itself was known. The honour of commemoration since, 19, or since 1795 has fallen on the Loyal Orange Institution and we continue and will continue to mark the notable events of 1690. We do so mindful that the civil and religious liberty we cherish and celebrate was one for all and is a birthright of all our fellow citizens in the United Kingdom. The legacy of 1690 is a strong legacy and it has survived the test of time as has the Orange Institution. Tyranny and arbitrary power was what King William and his supporters fought against. Today we highlight the tyranny and arbitrary and unaccountable power of the Paris Commission, an unelected quango which will leave no positive legacy and whose members will not long be remembered. We sympathise with all lodges who are victims of that body. The Commission must be replaced. The Commission is a reminder that 320 years on from the boy, we live in changing times and challenging times. Our society is changing rapidly. There are many who are anxious and indeed bewildered by the changes we have witnessed in recent times. We see the growth of secularism in a Christian nation. We see continuing attempts to undermine the moral fabric of our society. We see efforts to break up the union. We see government pandering to all sorts of minorities against the wishes of the people. Many feel that they are witnessing attempts to turn the world as we know it upside down. The Orange Order is no stranger to challenge and will continue to face challenging times with confidence. As a community, we must be prepared for challenges ahead. We at the Grand Lodge have a community education program that explains the culture and traditions of the Orange Order. And we have some excellent working relationships with schools, many of them in the maintained sector. Pupils there are interested, informed, challenging and courteous to the Orange Order. But in the state sector, with few exceptions, we find little uptake for our programs and we often find young people who are unaware of their heritage and wish to know more. There is a challenge to educators in this situation. Within our state sector, many of the pupils will have some family member in the Orange Order, some may be in a band, many of them will collect for bonfires. They will come from families interested in the Boyne, the Covenant and the Song. Is any of this discussed in the classroom? Or is it seen as something to conveniently forget where possible? If that's the attitude taken, then no one should be surprised if there is disengagement from education. The system needs addressed. If it is not, then we should expect the culture of the streets to inform young minds. We must challenge our society on such matters. We also need to challenge ourselves as well. We are heirs to the Protestant sense of individualism, but we must not be slaves to that. 
One of the things often remarked about Roman Catholics is that they're more collective than us, assisted by the fact they have one church and a parish structure for their sporting organisations. When it comes to benefits and grants, the Roman Catholic community has been far ahead of us. It has worked with a collective aim and it's got results in its communities. And you have to be impressed by that. We should not confuse individualism as Protestants in religious terms with not working together as Protestant communities, orange lodges and groups. We should take a lesson from our neighbours. As a unionist community, we should be working closer together. There are many who call for unionist unity, and that is an admirable aspiration. Truth, of course, is that it is easier to encourage others to be united than it is to achieve it. What can be achieved are closer working relationships, and it's been encouraging in recent years to see the working relationships develop between the bands, associations, and the loyal orders working closely together, as evidenced by the recent Department of Social Development study that showed the economic benefits that the loyal orders and bands bring to society. And that revealed a spend of £55 million plus each year in the local economy. So the important message is that we can cooperate closely together as a unionist community, and we need to do so to ensure the truth about us is known. As an Orange institution, we must look to the future. There are challenges ahead, both internal and external. To meet them all, we need to build the institution. The Grand Lodge is challenging lodges to recruit more members and to ensure that we retain them. Our message for those watching us on parade today is don't just watch it, walk it. The Orange Order is the unique expression of a cultural heritage and it is modernising, hoping to attract new members to complement those with lengthy membership experience who've held the line for so many years and will walk with us to the future. Play your part in preserving our culture by joining the Orange Order, rejoining it if you were once a member, or bringing new ideas to the Lodge meeting. It's the largest Protestant fraternity in the world. Join our ranks and walk with us. We are preparing through the development of World Orange Interpretive Centres at Belfast and Loch Gaul to tell the story to a much wider audience and to preserve our Orange heritage. This Peace 3 funded project will see an unprecedented outreach to the wider community, particularly to the nationalist community, to enable them to learn more consider more and discuss more about our traditions. We go forward with confidence and look forward to the engagement that will occur with all sections of the community. The Orange Order has a story to tell and it will be told as never before. But I have another challenge today and it concerns tolerance and mutual respect. It concerns some people who are not with us but who have in some areas been out protesting as we pass by. The Republican community has been involved in seeking to engage in conflict transformation. Well, as we see things, the conflict here has been transformed. It has been transformed from a murderous terrorist campaign to a cultural war against Protestants, the Union and the symbols and emblems which we hold dear. There are still arson attacks in Orange Halls and still protests against Orange Parades. It's not okay to fly the Union flag from Belfast City Hall and other council headquarters, but it appears to be okay to name a play park after a terrorist murderer involved in the slaughter of innocent Protestant workmen. But it's not alright and we do not accept it. It is morally wrong. Republicans should be aware that we have difficulty grasping their ethos and their actions. The tricolour, which later became the flag of the Irish Free State, first appeared in the 1830s. It contained bands of orange and green to symbolise what those who designed it regarded as the two great traditions of Irish society. And the white band in the middle symbolised peace between them. The official Irish government website states the flag as a whole is intended to symbolise the inclusion and hoped for union 
of the people of different traditions on the island of Ireland. It adds, down to modern times, yellow has occasionally been used instead of orange, but by this substitution, the fundamental symbolism is destroyed. What has become of the high ideals of William Smith O'Brien, the man who designed the tricolour? Whenever Republicans protest against us, they raise the tricolour, and it seems they forget the orange within their own flag. Perhaps their republicanism is fired more by sectarianism and not the traditions of Wolf Tone, William Smith O'Brien and others. Republicans, by their actions, have de facto turned their backs on the tricolour. And that is indeed the crux of our challenge to Republicans. What then of the orange tradition? What then of us? If the nation cherishes all her sons and daughters as you say, then how does the nation relate to those who wish to be part of the United Kingdom and who feel no affinity with the Republic? We don't want to be in a Republic and you can't make a United Ireland out of a disunited one. Some have reverted through the generations to the violent Republicanism of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and then the IRA and have tried to change things by wiping some people out and intimidating the others. But you have not succeeded and we are still here. We're still a proud people, we're still undaunted. Neither Republicans nor the Parades Commission have broken us and they never will. A century ago, as was mentioned earlier, our forefathers were so frightened about their future that they organised against Home Rule. Less than a century ago, when it came to the boundaries of a separate Northern Ireland state, our forefathers, rightly or wrongly, argued that nine counties would be too problematical because of the population balance. They were worried that a Roman Catholic electoral majority would come about and would vote for the United Ireland, which they feared. The decision abandoned Unionists in three counties of Ulster to the Irish Free State. The final settlement also confirmed nationalist majorities in Tyrone and Fermanagh to being in Northern Ireland when they felt they should have been in the Irish Free State. These events of a century ago must inform us all of where we are today and how we got here. Many people from both communities were unhappy. It was not a perfect solution. It was, however, probably the best solution at the time. And the central question it's whether you believe that seeking to change the constitutional status of Northern Ireland was justified by violence. We clearly do not. Nor do we as Unionists understand how it's possible to describe those who take out weapons and kill or maim as victims. The political theorist Hannah Arendt reflects that violence by itself does not achieve power or public freedom. Violence rather, she says, stands ready to destroy this freedom. Violence which is designed to destroy the state is revolutionary violence and that is what we witnessed in the 20th century. Republicans seem to argue the violence was necessary because the state was discriminatory. And the truth is that it was not perfect but it was only a foundation intended to be built upon. The building, for a variety of reasons, did not progress as well it might have, and there were faults on both sides, but mostly, mostly people were captives of the historical processes of their time. But there was nothing in all of that which justified murder. Nothing to justify pulling the trigger of a gun, nothing to justify planting a bomb, nothing which justified a terrorist campaign. And we will not allow a narrative to develop which excuses that terrorist campaign and absolves those who took part in it. People got caught up in situations and that may explain what they did. But it cannot explain or excuse murder or violence. They are wrong. Murder, as Pope John Paul II said during his visit to Ireland, is murder. The terrorists were not freedom fighters. They were enemies of freedom. They took away the most basic freedom of all, the right to life. Republicans have been working hard to bring a dysfunctional interpretation of terrorists and victims into common parlance. But it won't wash. 
This organization lost 337 members murdered during and as a result of the terrorist campaign. We have heard no sense of remorse from republicanism in relation to that. And remorse is the indicator of genuine regret. Can it be so difficult to express regret for loss and suffering? In our view, Northern Ireland can only move forward progressively when such remorse is genuine and possible. The challenge for the Republican movement is how they relate to their Unionist and Protestant neighbours as we move towards the future. They have never really addressed this central issue. It has been the elephant in the room. In fact, it has been the elephant grazing contentedly in Ireland's fourth green field. The Republican movement must consider these matters. When our parades are prevented, we see little sign of tolerance and respect towards us. And the challenge for the nationalist community is to ensure that their constitutional voice is heard above that of Republicans and that they do not simply try to be greener than green in how they deal with the Orange Order and the Protestant community. They too must remember the hopes of William Smith O'Brien and his optimistic tricolour. But the real challenge for both Republicans and Nationalists is that the majority of people in Northern Ireland, Protestant and Roman Catholic, do not want a united Ireland and they are the people who count in a democracy. And the challenge for all of us is in going forward to a shared future together. It will require us to challenge ourselves and our perceptions of one another. We have not been able to choose our travelling companions and it may be a difficult journey, but the road ahead goes to a single destination, the future, so we must all share the journey. The Parades Commission is currently blocking the road and no one should doubt the potential dangers which they have created by their actions and they must be replaced. But let us be proud to take our culture and our heritage with us and let us all value the rights of others to do the same. We ask for nothing more but we expect nothing less. Thank you.